Good evening, everyone. Those of you who are watching live and those of you who will be joining, uh, I mean, or watching this later, as always, what I want to do, just forgive me, I must find a better way to do this. I'm going to um, share this on my personal Facebook page. And I asked that if um, you know people who could benefit from this class, that you would share the link on their page or send them a message about it. And uh, I'm certain we're going to have a good time. And Ricky, I see that you've joined. Uh, I'm glad you got the book. I hope it's a blessing to you. And I understand that you're leading out in your class this week. And this is a good lesson. Just give me a second to get my page up. My second computer isn't as fast as it needs to be. Um, we have a good discussion this evening to talk about the uh, worshiping is, um, you know, being a worshiper, worship is always something uh, that's relevant regardless of when it's talked about. And Brother Ricky and Jasper, I need the, you're not too far from me. I'm actually in Canton, uh, Georgia, and I don't think Jasper is too far. Um, I have some friends that do some work there in Jasper. And for everyone else who joins, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to join and being a part of the Sabbath School ministry. And I'm almost there where I could share this. Here I am. I'm going to share this. Uh, share it on my page. And I will also, as my custom is, after we're finished this evening, I will share it. Uh, I'll put it on my YouTube page. So those of you who, or you know, people who aren't on Facebook, they want to view it, they can view it afterwards. Simply go to my website, sabbathschoolcoaching.com, and you will see a link on the page for my YouTube page. And you can subscribe uh, on that page. So every time I post something, uh, you'll get a notice for it. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, for those of you who are on time, as Sabbath school people, we, we try to always be on time. Sometimes we're the first people in the church, and unfortunately, sometimes we're the last people to leave. Before we get started, I wanted to share something that I think, um, I should say, I think I know uh, helps us to become better teachers. And I have a little section in my book on page 41 for those of you who don't have a copy of my book, make sure you get a copy. Uh, not only to support me, but I think it will bless you. Uh, it's a little, page 41, it's called Speech. And I want to read just a few things from this page. It says, the greatest teacher the world has ever known was the most definite, simple, and practical in his instruction. Uh, there is no higher example for a teacher to follow than the example given by the greatest teacher of all time, Jesus Christ. His method of communication can never be improved upon and has lasted undiminished through the ages. Mark 12, 37 says, and the common people heard him gladly. Many times we are mesmerized by the eloquence of the world's great orators. I love hearing, you know, people who are powerful speakers. However, our mission as Sabbath school teachers is not to emulate the world's great orders, but to communicate eternal truths in a manner best suited for his reception, which is simplicity. And here's the last quotation I wanna read before we get started. Christ always used simple language, yet his words tested the knowledge of deep, unprejudiced thinkers. His manner of teaching should be followed by teachers of today. Spiritual truths should always present it, should always be presented in simple language that they may be comprehended and find lodgment in the heart. Thus Christ addressed the crowds that pressed and thronged about him and all learn and unlearn 
were able to comprehend his lessons. That's Ellen White, Council of the Parents, Teachers and Students, page 261. We should be simple in our manner of speaking. And as I mentioned last week, and I'm sure I'll mention it over and over, that as Sabbath school teachers, everything that we do should be done from the eyes of a visitor. So how we talk and the things we discuss and the truths we try to explain and share should be done in as simple a manner as possible so that everyone can follow along. Um, we want to avoid using church jargon and cliches that only us in the faith understand. So as you are preparing your materials and as you lead your class, even if it's the same people every week, just anticipate that there will be a visitor there or that you're speaking to a, a, an entire uh, new class of visitors. How would you go about it? What would you change? So just keep that in mind. Uh, simplicity and doing it from the eyes of a visitor. Okay, so here we go. Uh, my goal again, I have to state this for those who are just joining for the first time, is not to have a Sabbath school class with you. That's not what I'm doing tonight. I am trying to give you uh, suggestions, a possible outline that you can use in your class on Sabbath. That's my goal, to give you a roadmap that you can tweak, change, cut and paste to, to make sure you have a, an interesting class. Here's what we want to do. We want to have interaction in our classes. We cannot be lecturers or preachers in our Sabbath school classes. We have to find a way to have maximum participation, uh, which means, as I always say, we can't cover everything in the week's lesson. You're going to find two or three points at most that you want to take the people. As a, as a Sabbath school teacher, you are the pilot of a class, a plane, uh, just picture that, and your job, get the plane in the air. As you know, some of you know, already know what that means. You need hands in the air. That's how you take off. Take them on the journey without getting hijacked, which we spent time last week about how not to get hijacked um, on your class. Taking them to a designation or a destination that uh, is relevant. So when you land that plane at the end of your class, they, they have a takeaway. Uh, so with that being said, oh, I don't know if I can give out a gift yet. Oh, I have to give out something. Uh, Ricky, last week, he knew the answer to a question, and I understand he got his promised book. And okay, so Ricky, you know this one. I see Darlene's online. She knows this. Christina's online. She knows this. But Let's just rehearse it again for those who may be joining. When I approached my Sabbath school lesson preparation, what is the number one question that I am asking myself as I prepare to lead, to get my materials together for my class? What is the number one question that I'm asking myself? I'll give a second if someone wants to type it in. The number one question I should be asking myself. Uh, let's see here. I can't tell if someone's typing now, so I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. And I'll give you one answer, but I have to get some answers from you guys so I can give away some more stuff. The number one question that I should be asking myself is, how can this week's lesson help the people in my class? It's the number one question I want you to put in your head every week. How does this, how can this lesson, regardless of the subject matter, because we don't want to be purely biblical history teachers. Our role is not to roll into Sabbath school and then reread the quarterly to our class and give them a history lesson. We have to find a way to shape the material in a way that it inspires our class members to grow. Discipleship is what Sabbath School is supposed to be about. But it inspires our members 
not only to grow, but it encourages our members on how to deal with life. If you can do that, they will come back to your class. Your Sabbath school will grow. But if you take the easy way out and just do a history lesson every week, no one's coming out for that but us old people, okay? So the number one question is, how, how does this lesson help the people in my class? And this week we're talking about uh, worshiping the creator. Uh, maybe you thought about this question already, and if not, maybe just now. How do you think this week's lesson, besides the history that we're gonna talk about from Deuteronomy and Isaiah or whatever, how do you think this week's lesson can help people in your class? Anybody wanna to care to uh, type in something right quick for us all to see? How can, how does this week's topic, this week's subject, which is worship the creator, how can that help the people in my class? That's your question. All right, I'll wait for a second and I'll give you my takeaway, um, which is what I want but as a matter of fact, I'm teaching this week's lesson. I'm invited to First Church in Huntsville, Alabama this weekend. So I'll do a general lesson study for Sabbath school, which is great. I enjoy that. And then after lunch, we have a lunch. We'll do a couple hours together on not only for facilitators, but Sabbath school superintendents and all that. And so I am actually preparing not only for uh, tonight, but for Sabbath when I lead this discussion. So here's what I have as a takeaway so far, because I don't see anybody who's put it in. You're going to rely on me, I guess. I want people to take away from this week's lesson, and I'll, I'll say this in a little better way later, that true worship consists of more than just church attendance. Even if you love church and you're just blessed by church, True worship is more than church service, okay? And that's where I want to, that's where I'm taking the people on the journey, okay? I am going to take them on a journey of discovery. And as a Sabbath school teacher, that's what I want you to do. Take them on a journey of discovery, which means you are not giving all the answers. You are not making all the statements. You're going to take them on that journey by asking questions, sort of like a breadcrumb kind of thing. You're leading them by asking them questions. And I'm just tonight going to give you some suggestions on how to do that. The, the, the formula works, but you might want to emphasize something else from worship. Maybe uh, there's another aspect of worship that speaks to you more than something that speaks to I me. Mean, that's okay. We're all different people. We come at life in different angles. But whatever speaks to you, I'm going to give you a formula that you can use to uh, make sure you have participation, okay? That's one of my goals. I want you to have people's hands in the air and answering questions and making comments rather than just listening to you. Uh, I've attended many, many Sabbath school classes and the teachers have great information, but unfortunately they do 80%, 90%, I dare say sometimes 99% of the talking. And everyone else is just sitting there like this. That's not a good class. I don't care how great the information is, you need participation. So, all right, so Sabbath School, as you know, my regular people know this already. Let's see here. Question at the end of Thursday's lesson was powerful. And, and Christine, I'm gonna look at that because I'm pretty sure I saw that also. Uh, oh, oh, who we need to understand who the creator. That's a good question. It's a very good question. Uh, if you show up or come late or not at all. Uh, what if you show up or come late or not at all? Uh, Don, that's a, a situation I'll talk about, but before we get into this week's lesson, let me just give you some, some quick pointers on that. Sabbath school, and this is not a reflection on you, this is in general, Sabbath school must be worth the time to come to. Generally, generally only senior citizens will come out for just mediocrity. 
You know, it's just if you go on 915 to most churches, uh, I was a Sabbath school superintendent for nine years at a very large church. So I know the pain of this. But if 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 the people don't find value in Sabbath school, they, they're not going to come. I don't care how much you beg them to come. So here's the first thing I would tell you. Assuming you're going to have an interactive, lively class full of participation, even if no one's there, start on time. I remember times long ago where it was just me and one person. As a teacher, that's discouraging. I'm not going to tell the person there that's discouraging. I'm just going to say, hey, we got a great lesson today, and I'm going to go through my motions of the class knowing that I wish more people were coming. But start on time. Don't wait for people to come. But make sure that over the course of time, you develop a reputation that we have a good time in our class. The second thing I want to tell you this, and I have to get back to the, the thing, but I just want to give this, is because other people are having this issue. The second thing I want to tell you to help people to come to Sabbath school is that you must have something outside of Sabbath school. Every class should have a mission project do something that's meaningful in the community or for someone as a class, and that will give you you guys a sense of family, okay? And other people will say, hey, I heard that you guys are doing X, Y, Z. I'd like to be a part of that. Next thing you know, people joined your class, not because you were a fantastic teacher, but because you were doing something. If you are a small group, an action unit, Let's have some action, not just sitting together in church, okay? Those are my two quick tips, Don, uh, and I hope that helps you a little bit. Um, stay positive. But if you're doing, and I'm just making an assumption now because I don't know, if you are, if you are teaching your Sabbath school class by saying, okay, Monday's lesson, blah, blah, blah. Okay, Tuesday's lesson, blah, blah, blah. If you are my teacher, I'm not even coming to that. <laughs> I just want to say that in a kind way. I'm not coming out for that. That's why I want all of the teachers that I influence to teach with their Bibles only. That's how I want you to do it. And if you look back on, the, this is our fifth session. If you go back to look at some of their prior sessions, I, I spend more time on how you can teach by just using your Bible. That's what I want you to do. I want you to teach just with your Bible, okay? All right. Um, so let, let me give you some suggestions. Maybe somebody else has a suggestion. I need to get the plane off the ground. How do I get hands in the air? I need hands in the air. How do I get hands in the air? Kimberly, I see your question there. Uh, I said so I could ask the next thing I'm going to I could use the podium. Line. Okay, I'm going to answer your question, uh, Kimberly. That's a great question. Uh, great question. Okay, well, let's get back. How do I get hands in the air so that I can start my journey? I got to get people. I got to get the plane off the ground to take them on a journey. How do I get people's hands in the air? For those of you who have been on, let's see here. Let's see here. If anybody wants to give me the answer, how do I get hands in the air? What is my number one secret for getting participation, initial participation? Oh, let's see here. Let me scroll down a little bit. My man from Australia, yes. Start off with a question to get the hands in the air. Yes, yes, Janae. I, I don't know if I'm saying your name right. Janae, Janine. Uh, but what type of question always works? It never fails. It's my secret if you look... All right, by asking what is worship. There we are. Ricky, you're hitting it. I need to get people's hands in the air. And I'm going to lead my class by asking questions, not by making statements, okay? So I always start this way and at, at First Church. It may not, I may tweak this, but by the time I get there, and Sister Kelly, I saw you join. So you'll, you'll hear some of this maybe again. But I always say, listen, Grass, we got a great class this week. I do a little uh, housekeeping to let people know I need their comments to be short. 
and to stay on topic because we're going to have a lot of participation. I already know that. But I always start with my secret weapon. I don't tell them this is what it is, but I start with a definition question. A definition question. That's what I'm going to start with. So here's the one. Here's the one I have for you tonight. Here's a good question, and I guarantee, if you ask this question on Sabbath, so we're going to have a. Here's here. Let me just role play it out. Uh, class, we got a great subject today. We're talking about worship the Creator. We're going to cover some great material. But to make sure we're all on the same page, because we're going to be talking about worship. What does the word worship? Watch how I say this. What does the word worship mean to you? That's my question. Regardless of what the topic is, I'm going to find something that I could say. What does X mean to you? I'm not going to say, class, what did the lesson tell us? Does anybody want to share something they learned from the lesson about worship? Chances are most people haven't even read the lesson, okay? I'm teaching from the eyes of a visitor who just happened to wander in to the church and say, what y'all doing in here? So I want to ask them a question. So I'll say, what is what does the word worship mean to you? Someone's going to raise their hand. Well, I think it means this. Oh, great. Tell me more about what that means, Alel. Well, I think it means so-and-so. All right, well, that's great. Does anybody else, even if I get the perfect answer the first time, I'm going to say, does anybody else want to share what the word worship means to them? I guarantee, depending on the size of your class, you're going to get multiple hands in the air. Now the plane is off the ground. That's my goal. I need participation. I've already, here's my notes for tonight. Here's my notes for tonight. I already looked up the word uh, worship and I know what the answer is. So I'm not going to say, class, we're going to be talking about worship. And worship is reverent honor or homage paid to God or something or someone. I'm not going to do that. I want them to go on the discovery, the journey of discovery. I'm going to ask them what they think it means. After I ask some people what it means, uh, I ask them what it means, I now have to, to get them on the journey to my takeaway where I'm trying to land. I got 40 minutes, 45 minutes, however long. I got to pace myself, okay. I have to, we just can't talk about, you know, shoot the breeze and all. I got to take them someplace. And I must say that this week, now some of you are, are watching this from uh, either now live or later. You're watching this in different parts of the world. Um, and But here in America, it's been a devastating week um, here in the States. Just devastating. Every day. It's just like more and more dark clouds uh, of just despair. And when our people come to our class, we need to be that ray of hope and light and, and all those things that help people to deal with all the craziness that is in this world. And this week's subject is to on worship is one that if we teach it right, it will give them a resource on how to deal with life, okay? All right? All right, so I got I got hands in the air, hope. And we talked about hope last year. And Kimberly, those are some great questions. Uh, ask them to act out worship and ask why. Um, that's a tough one. Um, Depending on your class, and I, I just want to answer Kimberly's question, um, most people aren't comfortable with acting things out. They're just not. Now, maybe your class is very creative and unique, uh, but if I, was, if I wanted to have something acted out, I would do that in my preliminaries, maybe have a little skit where we act out types of worship. What you want to do is keep in mind that what if there are visitors here? Every step along the way, I want a visitor to feel able and capable of being able to participate. Not to say that your suggestion is not, not valid, but I would just be hesitant about asking my class members to act out something uh, spontaneous without letting them know about it, okay? 
uh, because I don't I don't want silence. I, I can deal with a couple of seconds of silence, but I don't want to just you know everything to go dead. Okay. All right. So uh, here's the remember the formula that we use to teach with our Bibles. That's, that's what I want you to do. I'm adamant about that. I'm not going to change. I've had heated debates with teachers all over the world, convincing, trying to convince teachers, it's okay to teach this week's lesson with your Bible. Study the quarter thoroughly. But when you come in, come in with your notes and teach with your Bible only. Okay, so I got people's hands in the air. I got them to, to participate by they're telling me what worship means or whatever word you want to use. You might want to use, well, you might say, class, we're going to talk about the difference between worship and idols. Well, so what does the word idol mean to you? And that's a good one too. Okay. So now that I have now that I have participation, does anybody know what I should do next to keep this this plane going? Does anybody remember what I should do next? Any of my uh, faithful viewers? Oh, you're probably typing it in. I'm gonna just jump ahead of you. Because, oh, it's 9.25 already? Oh, my gracious. Okay. What I want to do next is I'm going to ask for a volunteer to read something related. I've already got the text outlined. So here's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to ask a question and get the conversation started. I'm going to ask a volunteer to read the lesson. And really, for the sake of time tonight, we could just use the memory text uh, from this week's lesson uh, which are great, Isaiah 58, verse 6 and 7. When I ask someone to read those memory texts, I am not going to start telling you what those texts are saying. I'm not going to start talking about something else. I'm going to use those texts as the basis of my next question. Someone reads the, reads the lesson. My very next question is, class, what does Isaiah, the verses we read here, Verse 6 and 7, what do they teach us about how God views worship? And I'm going to be quiet. Someone's going to read that, even if it's a visitor off the street. They're going to read that. They're going to read that. They're going to read that. And they're going to say, well, I think it means this. And I'm going to say, oh, tell me more with that. Oh, why do you say that, John? All right. John gives an answer. We talk about it. Does anybody else want to share? What, why do you, what do you think these verses are telling us? That's what I'm going to do. So let me give you the formula because I can't even get through all my notes tonight. I got so much good stuff. Um, but let me give you, so here's what I'm going to do. Here's the formula, and I'm going to give you some questions. You can go back later and try to get these if you want these, okay? Here's the formula that I want you to use. You're going to ask a question, get answers. The very next thing you're going to do is ask for a volunteer to read. You and your class may choose to call on people. That's not my habit. I always ask for a volunteer to read rather than pick someone to read, okay? When someone reads the verse, I will then use whatever verse it is as a launching pad to keep moving this plane along by asking the class what these verses are telling us. I already know what they're telling us because I've studied it, okay? So that's the formula. Ask questions. Get answers. Have someone read the Bible, text, text, a text, text. Do that four or five times. Your time is over. Class is over. And everybody was in their Bible. Everyone was participating. They'll love it. So let me give you some, some questions before we get out of here that you might want to consider. If I was reading Isaiah 58, 6, and 7 uh, about, you know, what these verses tell us about worship, one of the questions I would probably ask the class because I'm trying to take them someplace, is can a person be a true worshiper while ignoring Isaiah 58? That's a powerful question. I wouldn't even want anyone to ask me that question. But you're going to get some good responses from that, okay? People are going to, obviously, people are going to say, well, probably not. Probably not. And the answer is, if this is what God says that he requires, that's what we must give. Okay, we can't be like, you know, the Cain and Abel story where one brought what they thought uh, would suffice. Uh, we don't want to be that one. Here's another question that you can ask. 
uh, that you might want to use and you can come back to later uh, is how if I'm not there, how do I get there spiritually? Like, like that's not natural for me uh, to be that kind and loving or generous or thoughtful or helpful? As, how does a person get there spiritually? That's a very good question. I'm going to give you some quick answers. Uh, one of them is from our, our lesson this week is Deuteronomy 10, verse 17 and 19, uh, where it says, uh, it talks about God and he says, remember your situation. One way is to remember what God has done for us. That, that generates that, that impulse to do the same thing. And the one that I'm probably going to spend time with uh, at the church where I'm going to this Sabbath in Huntsville is Psalms 119, 130. It says, the interest of thy words giveth life. That's, that, that text really spoke to me this week as I prepare for tonight. Because if I, as a believer, am too busy or too preoccupied to spend time with my Bible, learning about Jesus and his will for us, chances are that I won't develop into the kind of person I need to be. By beholding, I become changed. So I'm going to emphasize that Christ must be the theme of our contemplation and adoration. That's what I want to try to suggest to people, okay? All right, uh, let me see here. I got another couple of questions before we get out of here, and then I'll answer some of your questions. I would probably say class now there's a there's 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 a twofold benefit from true worship. One we've already discussed, or well, probably both by the time I would ask this question is what are the twofold benefits of true worship? One answer is it helps us grow spiritually, you know, truly worshiping God, not just outside of church, but as we fellowship together in a church service, helps us grow. And we, if we do it right, as Isaiah 58 is, we become the hands and feet of Jesus. So by our true worship, we're blessing other people. That's what this quarter is all about. It's all about uh, the least of these uh, ministering to people, okay? Uh, so, and I told you that my method is that I always find a story to tell to tie it all together. And I may change the story by Sabbath when I'm teaching, but, but for this week, I thought about a story about worship. The Bible says a lot about worship. If you just do a look up on worship, text, 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 text on worship. But I'm drawn to the story about the two demoniacs who met Christ, uh, you know, and they were wild men. And it says when, when you know, when they approach uh, to worship him, Instead of that, the demon spoke, and and I I, I want to somehow explain that that in many in, in our hearts we want to do the right thing, but because of forces and habits and 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 other issues in life, the wrong thing comes out. We do the wrong thing. We say the wrong things many times. But by, just like these demoniacs, their encounter with Christ, their encounter with Christ changed the trajectory. Not only changed the trajectory of their life, it changed completely how their lives were. And if we read down a few verses, this is from Mark 5, where it says they were clothed and in their right minds. And, and he said, go back and tell the good things. And they went throughout the capitalists and, and, and shared all that God had done for them. That's a powerful story that many times we're not where we want to be in our experience. But if we have that encounter with Christ, that, that he, could, he could make it, he could put us in our right mind, and then we could do what we really are meant to do, okay? What we call it to do. So, man, the time goes too fast. This, our time is gone. 30 minutes went by so fast. And I want for you on Sabbath that, that you run out of time, okay? That, that you say, man, I, we had more we had more to do uh, than we had time for, and that's a good thing. Now, let me just go back here right quick, because Kimberly, you had a few questions. How do you manage resources such as a Bible lesson and notes as you teased last week? I said so I could have access to my Bible and notes. 
the podium, my class in the sanctuary. Okay, it's tough teaching a class in the sanctuary. That's, that's, that's tough. And ideally, I wish we all had classrooms, you know, but it's not an it's not issue. I always have my, I don't have, I'll take in a sheet of paper that's more like this size with my notes, and I'll just sit it someplace where I could just kind of glance at it. So don't be afraid if you have to refer to your notes, um, but just have them, just have it available, okay? Um, again, uh, I want you to teach with your Bible only this week. If you haven't done it, do it. Try it. The number one promise of every Sabbath school teacher is found in the book of James. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask me. Not only will I give it to him liberally, I won't hold back. If you think, I don't really know how to do that. I heard what he said, but I'm not sure if I can do it. Ask for wisdom. If it's for God's glory, he's going to help you to do it. I guarantee it. So again, thank you all for joining. If you don't have any more questions, make sure you share this video or tell someone about it. Some, most of you have told me where you're viewing this from. Also, if you go to my page afterward, I'll post this video. The replay will be there. It'll be on my, my YouTube page. But if you are finding that you are having success, won't you share that not only with me, share that so I can share that with everyone to encourage others that, hey, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Sabbath school can be tough sometimes. It can be discouraging. But I'm telling you, you are doing something that makes a difference. Don't, 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 don't feel like it doesn't make a difference. It's not moving the needle. You're doing something that matters, okay? Remember, always aim high. Aim high. Ask God, bless your class. Expect him to bless your class. And I promise you, he won't let you down. I'm going to wish all of you that you have a great Sabbath, wherever you spend time this Sabbath, whatever class you are a part of or that you're leading out, that it's a great class and that, that as, a, as a result of Sabbath school, we all grow together as Christians. Thank you all for joining. And I'll be back next week. I'm going to make it all the way through this quarter. I promise I'm going to do this entire quarter, and I'll see you guys next week. Invite someone, and I'm so glad that we're becoming friends online. Everyone, please have a good night.